Hi, I'm George and welcome to part two of the Nova series. Now in this episode, we're going to have a look at the deployment mechanism and also have a look at finishing the rest of the rocket, uh, adding some fins and giving it a paint job. Now for the deployment mechanism, we really had three main criteria. Uh, one, that it was supposed to be quick and easy to build. Uh, it's supposed to be lightweight and finally very easy to operate. So let's jump straight into it. At first we looked at simplifying the mechanism we did for the horizon sustainer since it was already the right diameter but we didn't really need the high acceleration design and so we remembered a design by Julian and his team at Rocket Food. Julian had sent us a 3D printed nose cone with a door that we test flew a couple of years ago. Inspired by this design we decided to build something similar just in a smaller form factor. Previously, we only 3D printed the internal structure, but the nose cone and body tube were still made from fiberglass, which took a bit of work and lots of sanding and painting. So in order to satisfy the first design criteria, we decided to also 3D print the whole thing. Let's have a close look at the final design. In order to make it easy to construct, we really wanted to reduce the component count and any processes as much as possible, and we removed anything that just wasn't needed. 3D printing allowed us to make a single piece hollow nose cone in this complex shape. Something that wouldn't have been possible with normal molding machines, especially the void near the tip. You couldn't pull a mold out of it. The surface finish was smooth enough that we didn't have to do anything to it. And we chose white filament to reduce any thermal issues from the sun. This meant we could save a lot of time by not having to sand or paint it. The payload bay is also made from a single 3D printed section and it's designed so it doesn't need any support material. This houses all the electronics, batteries and servo motor. This section was also designed so that it didn't need any screws to hold any of the components in. You can just drop them into their respective pockets. Here's the servo motor, it just slides right in. The servo timer comes next. And we can plug the servo motor right into it. We can also drop in an altimeter one, followed by the batteries. Then we can connect the batteries to the servo timer and the payload bay is assembled. So you're probably thinking what stops all those things falling out? For this reason, the nose cone has these tabs printed in it as a part of the design. And when you push the nose cone onto the payload bay, those tabs are positioned so that the components will stay in place. This also makes it very easy to swap components between rockets if you want, for example, to use the altimeter in another rocket. If you were to use different sized batteries or a differently sized altimeter, you can just print a different payload section. The hole down here is for the shock cord that attaches to the top of the pressure chamber. When the parachute deploys, the shock cord will swing back like this, and then eventually swing back this way. As you can see, there is nothing for the shock cord to catch on, and is free to swing in any direction. Though it looks like there isn't a lot of space inside the nose cone for the parachute, we can still fit a 70 centimeter diameter parachute in there. The parachute is held in place by this 3D printed door. It has a tab at the top of it to hold it in place and at the bottom just fits right here. The servo motor holds that in place until it's time to release it. Having the servo horn exposed like this means it's very easy to load the parachute without even having to turn on the unit. There's a little notch at the bottom of the door and this keeps the door aligned with the nose cone so it can't slip sideways. The door itself is attached to the shock cord so we don't lose it during deployment. The Phoenix deployment mechanism used a spring to get the parachute clear, but again to simplify the design, we omitted this altogether. The parachute just has nothing to catch on in the nose cone, so it's very easy for it to just fall out into the airstream. The door once released really acts as a small drogue to help the parachute clear. Instead of a spring, we're actually using the parachute itself to help pop the door out. It doesn't need to move by much, just for the top tab to fall out. So let's have a look at how that works. We'll turn it on and then let the timer trigger the servo.
we actually went through quite a few iterations before we settled on this design. At first we had the components slipped in from the bottom of the payload bay and the mounting ring was what was going to keep them in place. But it meant that the payload bay had to be longer. Since there was space in the nose cone, we decided to let the components poke out at the top of the payload bay and into the space in the nose cone. This made the design more compact and hence lighter. It also meant that we could detach the entire nose cone from the rocket and none of the components would fall out. Just for a fun comparison, here are our previous deployment mechanisms designed for this diameter airframe. This is shadow, then dark shadow, then this is horizon, and here is Nova. So that's the deployment mechanism complete. Now, when we compare it to the Horizon one, uh, this one actually had 59 individual components and the Nova one has just 15. So we're quite happy with that. Uh, the overall weight without the parachute is 103 grams. And if we have a look at the construction time for the Horizon one, this was about four or five days because of all of the fiberglassing and painting that we had to do. Whereas with Nova, this was six hours of 3D printing and about an hour of a little cleanup and getting all the components in and configured. So we can actually build two of these in one day. So let's go finish the rest of the rocket and attach the deployment mechanism to the top of it. Fins we're making again from carbon fiber sheet we bought from Hobby King. This time though, the sheet is only 1.1 millimeters thick. Because this rocket isn't designed to go very fast, we can get away with thinner stock. The fins are a little smaller than on the Horizon sustainer, but not by much. This was done to keep the rocket stable in the early part of the flight because it uses a small nozzle, so it takes longer for the water to drain. The heavy water near the tail of the rocket moves the center of gravity way back. All the fins together weigh just 42 grams. Next, we mark out the locations where the fins are going to go. To make it easier to make the fins, we are putting them only on the cylindrical part of the rocket. We give the pressure chamber a fresh sand where the fins will be glued. We're using our fin alignment jig again to hold the fins in place while the glue dries. We normally use 24 hour epoxy to tack the fins on, but because we're trying to speed up the whole manufacturing process, we've used the five minute epoxy here, which is only about half the strength. Before, it used to take about two days to get all the fins attached with the fillets as we had to wait eight hours between attaching each fin. With the five minute epoxy, we were able to attach each fin after about 45 minutes. After the fins are tacked on, we can mask the areas around the root edges where the fillets will go. The fillets are made with epiglue again, as this epoxy is a gel epoxy and it won't sag under gravity. We can do all the six fillets at the same time. We just lay the epoxy along the root edge and then use a small tube to form the fillet. Most of the strength from the joint comes from the fillet, so it's not critical that we use the five minute epoxy to tack them down. This means we were able to cut out the fins and get them glued in place with fillets in about three hours. That's even more time saved and then we let this cure overnight. The next day we remove the masking tape from the rocket body and add masking tape to the rest of the fins. We also drill a hole in the top end cap. This allows us to insert a pin that will be the shock cord attachment point. We can pull the pin out at any time to disconnect the shock cord. We then give the rocket a light turn with 240 grit paper to make sure we remove any fingerprints. The rocket is then sprayed with a few even coats of spray putty. This helps fill any surface imperfections and sanding marks. Three hours later, this is all dry and we give the rocket a light sand again with 240 grit paper. We didn't send the putty right back all the way to the fiberglass like we normally do because it gives it a more even finish. If we sand it too far back, you get patches of black and then that requires more top coats to hide it again. Straight after sanding, the rocket can be painted. Again, for speed of construction, we're using this Duramax paint that dries really quickly. We give the rocket a few coats over about an hour. 
we found that it was better to do slightly thicker coats with this paint to give a smoother finish because it dries so quickly coming out of the can which gives it a slightly matte finish if the coats are too thin. Two hours after the last coat the rocket can be handled without affecting the paint. It's pretty impressive stuff. We can then remove the masking tape from the fins and the nozzle and the pressure chamber is almost finished. The pressure chamber now weighs 341 grams. The last thing we need to do is attach the base ring that will mount the deployment mechanism to the pressure chamber. We're using the 24 hour epoxy here because of the strength that we need. We are also using three angle brackets to align the deployment mechanism with the ring to make sure the nose cone won't be crooked. Once the ring is taped down we remove the brackets and stand it up on its end to let it cure overnight. This means we went from the bare tested pressure chamber to finished rocket in only two days. To stop the nose cone from falling off we secure it with a set of three small screws. These are just self tapping screws. We can then take the end of the shock cord, tie a loop in it and attach it to the top of the pressure chamber and the pin just slides right in. To attach the entire payload section to the rocket we again use a set of three small screws. Eventually we're likely to redesign this so that the top and bottom can be twisted together and locked with just a single screw. So that's the rocket finished along with the deployment mechanism. Uh, now before we launch it we want to weigh it um, so that we can run our simulations and we can see that that's 482 grams uh, which is really light. We're really happy with that. Uh, now to launch it uh, we're using one of our uh, older cluster launcher release heads. We modified the nozzle seat for the 7mm nozzle that this rocket uses and we've also added a control box uh, that's remotely triggered um, with our remote trigger. Uh, but to see that launch you'll have to wait for the next video which will be coming up soon. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.